Thundergrunt. How's it going? Good, good. I want you guys to introduce yourselves. Tell us who you are. I am Jimmy George. I am a full-time script consultant and screenwriter. I am Jamie Nash, screenwriter and sometimes author. And my book, The 44 Rules of Amateur Sleuthing, (laughs) is now available on Audible. Pick it up, click on it, go to it, listen for your ears. And I'm Bob Rose. I'm a jack of all trades. All three yes. that I do. My sort favorite of. Bruce Campbell television show. Yeah, that's why I said that. <laughs> is that what it was called? Yeah, no, it was Jack of All Trades. Yeah. Like that. I kind of like Briscoe County a bit more, but County. we're not going to argue that today. Okay. We're not going to talk about that today. It didn't well, win any Oscars. <laughs> no. Welcome to Groovy, the Bruce Campbell podcast. <laughs> <laughs> not a bad idea, that's Jamie. A great idea. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to do a weird episode for Writer's Blockbusters. It's yeah. going to be our best Oscar screenplay winner episode. Yeah, we're mixing it up. Is that the title? Is that best Oscar screenplays? We're a few weeks late from the Oscars, but yeah, it's been a while. But it was, I think it was a really topical year for screenplays, right? Uh, Spike Lee and everything. Um, Mm -hmm. That was adapted, though. I'm so glad he won. Yes, so glad. But that that was adapted. We're talking originals. Originals, yeah. Right, all are all our choices I cho- are all the ones I chose right? were originals. Uh, I'm trying to think. Exorcist okay. was Exorcist a book. Exorcist was a book. Damn it, no, it's okay. Hey, we, That's I, okay. Spoiler. <laughs> so what we're gonna do? This is a weird Shit. one. We I'm gonna change it now. We all gave each other homework that we had to pick three uh, uh, Oscar winners for screenplays, and then we're gonna each talk about one thing that of that screenplay that we want to discuss with the rest. of yeah. us. Yeah, and uh, I think Jimmy. Only did, you only did two. I only did so two. Don't get mad at but us. I overdid it on both. <laughs> He's got I a bunch of paper in front of him. Known to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jimmy did Green Book and well, I don't know what was no. the other adaptation. Crashing by? Green Book by yeah. Jimmy George. No. <laughs> <laughs> Filmmaking <laughs> excellence. There you go. Um, yeah. So that's what we're gonna. This is a, this is a weird one. So we're gonna talk about. I'm uh, excited. Eight movies. Yeah. And we're gonna go in the in round. an hour. In Let's an hour. do it. I say we start with Jamie. Because yeah. it's it was his idea. This whole thing yeah. was his idea, right? In, in a weird sort of way. Well, well I was going to say, Jamie, what's the box office of these me. eight movies? Yeah, tell us. <laughs> well, no. let me tell you. <laughs> okay, so for my first one, I picked I picked Preston Sturges, The Great Mc, McGinty, the 1940. No, I didn't. I'm just <laughs> you might. I don't know. I <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> Everybody just turned off the podcast. <laughs> 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 Yeah, Preston. Sir- that was the first Oscar for best screenplay, by the way. Oh, okay. Pres- I don't even know. Shame that. on us for laughing. The Great McGinty. <laughs> We're only laughing because we weren't expecting <laughs> it. No, no. That's, Mr. that's great just, writing, Jamie. That's yeah. what comedy reversal is. Of expectation. The, un- the reversal of expectation. <laughs> right. Um, so the first one I actually picked was a movie that I actually saw many times in the theater, and it kind of shocked me. I liked this movie so much as a kid. I wasn't a kid. I was I guess I was a young adult. <laughs> um, Ghost by uh, Bruce Joel Rubin. Is that the guy's name? Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Um, he did Jacob's Ladder as well. That was another mm-hmm. one of his big movies that everybody likes to talk about. But when I saw this movie in the theater, for one, it was that mix of genre. You know, it had, mm-hmm. yes, it had the romance side. And like my sisters were probably there with me loving this movie just as much as I did. But then it had this whole supernatural element. It had a murder mystery. It had some comedy. You know, it had the whole thing. It was like the whole package. And I don't have a funny movie. It's a funny movie. It's a funny movie. And I don't have box office mojo up in front of me, but I think it made like five hundred million dollars. Yeah, it was a hit. It was a huge Huge hit. hit. I mean, especially back then. Swayze. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it, it was, it was like a superhero movie today, but it was an original movie with romance and. You know, and I think to have a movie that makes that much money, it needs to have something for everybody. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, for the bros like me, it had to have that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sorry. What? You got, me. Is... got me there, Jamie. 
<laughs> Jeez, I, no. Uh, so it, it had to have, you know, it had to have some supernatural murder mystery because I wasn't there for the um, pottery scenes. Yeah, uh, the pot- the <laughs> um, the, though I am now. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So what I the one thing I did want to point out with this movie, I. I did this for a couple things. There's there's one scene in that movie that I I picked out, that, and I did this for two of the movies. And that one scene is that scene where uh, they're coming out of the show. I, I think it was the um, the Mark of Zora. No, that's another movie. Uh, they're, they're coming out of Macbeth, and uh, and it does all these things. It's kind of the inciting incident of the of the movie, but it has all these twists and turns. Because on one hand, it establishes the arc. Uh, she comes out and she says she wants to get married. He's kind of questioning it. Right. They get into the whole conversation. You never say, I, you love me. He says, you know, and he says, well, sometimes words don't mean anything. And there's the whole ditto thing that comes mm-hmm. into play later. And then. Uh, I still yeah. quote that to this day. Yeah. Ditto. It's an easy yes. quote. Yeah. 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 Ditto. If somebody says, I love you, I say ditto. Yeah. Yeah. Some people get it. <laughs> I, I, I always say, I know. Right. ah that's good that's and then good. somebody says ditto no. <laughs> right. it's a, there's a whole thing that goes on uh th- then the guy comes out and robs them so to speak but we won't get into spoilers on what that really happened what it really happened to <laughs> he robs them the go- there's a fight spoiled ghost it's okay yeah yeah it's been a while <laughs> there's a fight well okay in the end bruce will no that's the different uh in the end the gunshot Dude, jamie's laying like joke <laughs> machine today man yeah. is this the morning zoo what is yeah. going on here? let me get my fart um, machine <laughs> weenie in the butt um, <laughs> um so the gun goes off he goes chasing after the shooter he comes back tears in his eyes he sees like how upset Demi is and he looks down and he's dead he's lying on the ground says so it's a huge twist that in retrospect, maybe it wouldn't feel that way if you watched it for the first time today. But when you're watching a movie back in those days, things surprise you. Uh, they, Are you saying that was like kind of that was this really quick way to world build? Like instantly? It was. Yeah. Instant world building. Like here's the premise just in one shot. He looks down and he's and, – and Swayze kind of does this great job of, of shock in that scene. He almost looks goofy yeah. for, for a weird sort of way. I yeah. agree. But it's kind of like – I think how you would feel if you saw that. It would just yeah. turn you goofy <laughs> for a few seconds. Uh, so, yeah. so he's he's looking down. They they put they bring all these things in, like the the light is there behind yeah. him, but he kind of turns away from that. People walk through him and he's shocked. And it's all this stuff in this one great inciting incident scene. And uh th- that scene always, you know, it was always a big deal to me because it has all these twists and turns. Yeah. It's got the gunshot going off. It, it's got him finding out that it's not him dead. Then him finding he's a ghost. Then, you know, and yeah. all these different things happen. So that it's one of the great inciting incidents, I think, to point to. It's just such a well-written one. The movie is structured amazingly. Um, it just has all kinds of twists and turns like that. One of the best expositive scenes ever in the subway. Yeah. Absolutely. With Vincent Schiavelli. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. The, the, the thing that really stands out to me when I, when I uh, took a look at it for this podcast was that premise delivery thing. Mm-hmm. It It's almost as if they wrote a list of every possible thing to get from the ghost thing. You know, it's, it, he sees his own funeral. He's trying to communicate with her and she feels him. She senses him. Yeah. There. He, he can, he, the cat actually senses him. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. the, the psychic, the, mm-hmm. the demons kind of, yeah. that are coming to get him. You can feel that construction. It, Absolutely. It, it, it totally squeezes every ounce of juice from its uh, premise. Yeah. So anyway, that's why I picked it. It's a it. great lesson. That's yeah, a good it's, call. It's yeah. a really good one to watch to be instructive for that and structure as well. And and quite frankly, character arc, it, it kind of has a little bit of everything. So that's why I picked that one. That's great good, double good feature choice. with that is The Frighteners. The Fri- yeah. I always consider those two uh, movies have kind of like similar ghost roles yeah. and they kind of remind because yeah. The Frighteners has a lot of scenes where people die and then they look at their body kind of like in yeah. ghosts. Mm-hmm. I never so thought about that. I always connect those two movies together. All right. That was number one. Jamie. Thank yes. you. You're Jimmy. 
I'm up next. You're up next. All right. Read your phone book. Yeah, I got my stuff. phone book here. I'm <laughs> not James Earl Jones, so I wrote bear down with like me. One point. And no, no. Right. I'll try not to look at it and just go, just wing it. Um, so I picked American Beauty, even though it's it's you know Kevin Spacey is canceled, and it's weird to talk about movies with him. But he now. didn't write the script. So. I know he didn't write the yeah. script, but it was you know, originally he's written for che- after a young teenager. Yes, you know, but it was originally <laughs> written for Chevy Chase. Know that so. I did not know that. Yeah, he like he Alan wanted, Ball said that. Yeah, no, they wanted Chevy Chase, and he said Whoa. no. Oh wow! Not that he's. Paulie right. Shore was second. <laughs> <laughs> Chevy Chase is kind of problematic these days. Whatever. Yeah, so. too, that's true. So I chose yeah. this for a number of reasons. And originally, I chose it because I thought we were only going to do one. So I was like, this has a ton of things I can talk about. And I, I But I'm fine with that we did multiples. But um, right. this is one of the first screenplays I ever read um, when I was learning. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I knew somebody back in the day who was an adult um, – who while I was a kid and he and he was friends with uh my parents friends and he was he had an agent in Hollywood his name was David Page I don't know what what's happening to him now but I was like a 14 year old kid and he had an agent in Hollywood I think he wrote hereditary <laughs> 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 but uh, he would, I would be like, "Can I read your scripts?" And and he just would hand me piles. So I had read like five of this guy's scripts uh, when I was a teenager. But the first professional script that I ever read was this one, mm-hmm. um, like the first one produced by Hollywood. Produced by Hollywood. Um, and now, there's... I remember the script was very different. There was a a trial framing or yeah. something like that. So so that's that? one thing. I mean, that's not what I planned to talk about. But yeah, so one interesting thing is, yeah, it there's a framing device that's a current affair. That's like right. That's it's right. it's it's not that show, but it's pretty much mm-hmm. that show, especially given the time late nineties. That mm-hmm. was like a huge hit. Good. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's a current affair kind of doing little news bits. Wait, was that Bill O'Reilly? Other problematic person? Was he current affair? Or was he inside edition? Oh, what was I think that inside he edition? Was inside edition. Yeah. Okay. I get him. So yeah. so and and it's a it's a trial for the murder of Kevin Spacey, mm-hmm. and uh, they should uh, have Chevy and... Chase play the role. <laughs> <of> the <anchor. laughs> <laughs> I'm Chevy Chase and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie is full of jokes. I, I know, love it. <laughs> um no, and then um every every about ten pages it would jump back to the framing device with uh uh, w- the bag guy with the camera. I can't remember his the character's name. Uh, Keith, I think. Uh, Ricky. You, you said um, the bag. The bag. The bag, the bag guy. guy. The Ricky. Thing the bag Ricky man. Fitz. Right. Ricky, Ricky Fitz, Fitz, Fitz is in jail. Ricky Fitz, right? In the script, and he's on. He's being accused of murder, and uh, uh, the daughter is on, like on on the stand mm-hmm. saying how much she hated her father. So There's all this. So shit. the reveal of who actually killed him was different because we actually had somebody the whole time that, that was assumed, accused. That was accused, right? And it built to unlike and also, the mystery of him just talking exactly. from voiceover. Okay, exactly. And he's in the script as a ghost floating over the scenes talking there's a theme so when you Mm -hmm. so when you (laughs) yeah so when you when all those scenes where his voiceover (laughs) shows what motivates the voiceover in the script is he's on the screen in pjs in the pjs he's murdered in he's got like a t-shirt and like flannel pjs floating over the so it's kind of a a little bit of a sillier movie uh it's not played that way but when you read it you're like this would have been silly so so it's no maybe a little six feet under us yeah you know? Very six feet under Alan Ball. That's yeah, a yeah. little silly. A little so, quirkier. Yeah. yeah. But this, that's American not, Beauty that's not why I chose uh, to anyway. talk about this. But I, it's interesting. But it's interesting I didn't know all to, that, note, so, to, yeah. to note. I mean, there's about 20 pages of the script that's out yeah. there. When I was starting screenwriting, the that, that was the script i remember reading too. yeah that was the one everybody was everybody reading. was talking yeah. about but and it and it's got also it, it taught me all these bad lessons it it, it actually has the characters uh Every single time they are in any scene, their character names are capitalized for the whole script. It's got a lot of weird improper formatting that I just assumed since it had won Oscar for best screenplay that I should follow. It's just one of those things. And there was this whole Twitter thing that blew up about format recently oh i was gonna say you imagine if twitter was around them this guy <laughs> uses we see yeah, yeah, there was screenplay. there was a huge thing recently you missed it jamie be glad you missed yeah. it no i i remember it yeah i, I saw so anyway it. but this it. was an example where yeah. it had like it had like scene numbers and it had um because it was a shooting script mm-hmm. and it had every single scene every single character's name was capitalized from fade in to fade out it had a lot of weird stuff that well, you're not supposed to do but it's um, a shooting script though. yeah so but what i'm saying is like it's just an example of these oscar winning screenplays that are out there that if you followed that as a learning tool from the first time you might 
get yourself into some trouble and have to unlearn some right. of this stuff. Neither of those things are the reason that I picked this. The end result <laughs> is the important result, in, yeah, my, exactly. in my opinion. No, that's a whole the other topic. The film is the actual that's thing. That's a yeah. whole other topic. Yeah, I, a whole my, thing, yeah. but, but when it comes to format, my rule but, is necessary versus unnecessary. But by the way, right o- Oscar... Um, the people voting on Oscars, I'd say 99.9% of them never look at the screen. They watch the movie <laughs> like we do in this podcast. Jamie, do you get to, you're, get, the guild is different, WGA, right? they send me screeners. They send me scripts too, but I watch the screeners. I, I never read the screenplays. Gotcha. They send you all these little books, like just for, they're, okay. they're the ones made after the movie is okay. finished. They send them so to you. you. Wa- so you watch movies on your small screen at home. What that's, would Spielberg That's right. Yeah. <laughs> How dare we're, you? We're, we're opening up all hey, these topical just, things I, and just skirt, skirting right over them. <laughs> he sent me the post last year, so I don't know. What, oh, you know really? Yeah, okay. I mean, he sends them out too. So. And you didn't watch it in the theater. Mm. Mm. I didn't. I didn't vote for him. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, okay, Jamie, so, Jamie, Jamie, Jamie. Uh, I mean, there's a million things you, we could talk about with with American Beauty, but I'm going to talk about wrong way goals because we haven't really touched on those at all. In I mean, what are we on episode 27? And I don't think we've done a wrong way goal movie. Um, and uh, so, a lot of movies are uh, the goal that the character is trying to achieve. How they're going after it is the wrong way, and you'll see this pop up in a lot of uh, coming of age and rite of passage stories. So you'll see it in like uh, this is a perfect example. This is like a, a midlife midlife crisis, right? Mm-hmm, right? And so a character is like going through all of this emotional pain and stuff, and in order to like alleviate the pain, they're taking all the wrong steps, right? They're drinking. They're just doing something the entire story that we as an audience are like, don't do that, which is an odd thing as an audience member to be rooting against a character achieving a goal. And so the other reason, like for instance, uh, Liar Liar, Mm -hmm. um, and there's a great William Martell article about this. If you look up William Martell, we've talked about him before. Um, He's got a great article that lists like 20 different examples, but a good example is Liar Liar. Jim Carrey's goal is to be a good father, and how he thinks he can do that is by just lying about everything. And he continues to lie even when he's incapable of telling a lie. He continues to try, but it's the wrong way. And then when he learns that he has to be honest and truthful, then right. he's he figures out what the audience has been telling him the whole mm-hmm. time. This is how you should be doing it. It's that's a common. I, I can't remember. I think it's a moral premise thing. Yeah, where the first half of the movie they try it the wrong way. Right, and usually around the midpoint they Isn't start Groundhog the, Day too. Yeah, it's yeah, the same. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a wrong yeah. way goal. And yeah. Then, yeah, and then yeah. usually around the midpoint after the moment of grace or whatever right. in, uh, in that model, um, they then they start to dabble in the better way to the do ba- it. They dabble. Dabble is a yeah. good way to put it because they're still kind they're of still learning, holding on still to learning. that wrong yeah. way. Like usually, I could just go back. Usually to it's it. like internal versus external. Like the exactly. external is exactly. the wrong way. Yeah, if I fix something physically exactly. it'll fix the problem and then it turns out you have to fix inside of you exactly and that's what this yeah. movie and so right. the other reason that i picked this and and uh like another good example is um my best friend's wedding she's trying to stop the wedding of mm-hmm. the person she yeah. loves when it, she has to move on with her expectations and her life and her own things. But mm-hmm. the whole time, for most of the movie, she's trying to stop this wedding, right? And you're like, no, <laughs> right, don't. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's a very clean, simple example. Um, with this movie, though, the reason I picked it not just for wrong way goal is I am a preacher of visual filmable goals. And Jamie, we've talked about this mm-hmm. many times. Um and this movie, it doesn't really have a filmable goal for the main character. The filmable goal is the wrong way, which is he, right. he's lusting after Angela and he wants to sleep with her. But that's and that's filmable and that's what he's after. And we can track that visually like he's working out. He's right. taking better care of himself. And every time he's around her, he's like doing this tiny little seduction. So we can visually track his progress toward that wrong way goal. But then what's interesting is. Once he like realizes that that's the wrong way, the movie's over. And he realizes, and it's like the voiceover says, he realizes that he already achieved it mm-hmm. because he started living his life. He like found his zest for life, and that was the need. Right. He needed to like reconnect with life, with humans, with like caring about like his day to day, every day. It only couldn't happen in real life. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. In Jesus. a weird sort of way, and I'm just riffing here. Yeah, do it. But it seems like that movie 
it's almost like being there or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's he's, a good call. He's the enlightened guy, and everybody else still is searching in some ways, but he's almost enlightened in, a, again, a wrong way. I mean, yeah, he is chasing it after. it is the wrong way. But at the same time, he is... He is a new man and a better man once he kind of says, screw it. I'm going to yeah. quit my job and speak my mind and throw spaghetti it's, against the wall. It's, yeah, also, exactly. it's yeah. also when you, you the audience roots for him, even right, though he's right. not a good person. Right. Right. Because he's kind of trapped it, it, well, in the family thing. If the, you watch it. Freedom, is, it's relatable. And he also is like fun in games when he's finally free. Right. Right. So you know what, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like now that, I could just yeah, buy, the fun I and buy games a sports is car the freedom. And, yeah. Is the, but it is that taste of life. That's really what it's all about. His need yeah. is he stopped living. It's a dead to alive arc. It's very clean. It's very easy to follow on that on the inner side of things. Um, but if you watch it, it's very interesting. What motivates him is everybody else living their life. So he watches Ricky Fitz qu- quit his job and he's like, "Holy shit, that's awesome." And he watches Ricky Fitz just like Fitz just like taking a drag of like of of a joint outside like it's no big deal and he's like, "Holy shit, this is mm-hmm. great. This guy like has not a care in the world. He's enjoying well, himself." I think uh I once wrote a, something about this movie for a website. I forget what. Oh, one. interesting. Uh and I, I mean, remember it was 99. It was not it's a while ago. Yeah. And I remember saying that Kevin Spacey's character is obviously way long ago. Kevin Spacey's character is in love with people who don't give a fuck. That's a good call. I mean, yeah. sorry about the language, but you no. know, it was tr- that's because you know what I mean. Like he's obsessed yeah. with the people that don't because he like he hates himself for caring, right? For it, for, it, for it, conforming, for putting conformity is good. A good yeah. call. He's like he's just given up. Yeah, mm-hmm. and all of these people are displaying actions that are the opposite that spark his life. Um, but but. I, I chose it for it's a raw it's a great it's, example it's of a wrong like way goal every, and it's so fascinating that it doesn't really have a filmable overall yeah. goal. If I could throw that this out there too, American Beauty is this weird like it almost like everyone is a manic pixie dream girl to him. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. if you know even, the trope of even, manic, yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, even like, the, even the men, even the men, yeah, yeah they're like. Oh. I mean, even the the neighborhood guys who take care of themselves and they're really chipper yeah. to him and he sees them and they, even those inspire yeah. him, you know, right, to be yeah, better. Right. So, like you said, he's enlightened mm-hmm. and by the end. And, and I think what really makes that work is his understanding and alignment with us that, oh, shit, this is wrong. Mm-hmm. In the very end, he realizes that he shouldn't be lusting after her. This is wrong. And that's like his final moment where he kind of earns it all. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like he's been making all these changes and then he earns our respect in the end by making the right choice and saying, I'm not. Or he at least earns a little bit of respect. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, before we move on from that one, 1999, these are the nominees. American Beauty, uh, Being John Malkovich, <sighs> Magnolia, The Sixth Sense. It's a and, strong, yeah. Strong and then, group. last but not least, a movie I don't even remember: Topsy Turvy by Mike Lee. Yep, I remember. Oh, it. Yeah, I don't remember yeah. it. Yeah, I was working yeah. at a video store, so I remember everything. Ah, from that time. yeah. But yeah. that's there's some pretty strong screenplays up there in that list. Yeah, that's I, crazy. I I just want to man- mention one thing, and then it, we'll man. move it on. Mm-hmm. I see this in client scripts and amateurs, and I when I see it, it's done <laughs> the wrong way, which is. Often I see this and a writer thinks what they need to get us to do is to root for that character to succeed. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that they need to be shifting all of this, all of the scenes to make the audience go like, don't do that. Right. Right? right. Like, like, uh, for instance, if it were my best friend's wedding, I would see an amateur client script who was actually getting us to hope that Julie Roberts succeeds in stopping the wedding, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. is not, how you handle right, this. Right. You want us you want us to root for them to do it the morally right way. Right, right. Yeah. That's all. Well, I'm super happy you picked American Beauty because I feel like we just got to do an episode on a Kevin Spacey movie without validating Doing. Kevin Spacey. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, so gross. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Jimmy, for kind of sh- wedging it. It's a great well, piece of I, filmmaking. I, I do think regardless. That someone out yeah. there is gonna not be happy that we gave it the time but sam mendez is a great filmmaker yep. and that's a great piece of writing yep. regardless of who's in it so and that bending peter gallagher i mean yeah it's a i don't feel bad cast. saying that Chris of, oh yeah so minor i i i think we all interpreted this assignment a little differently. i love that <laughs> yeah mine were a little bit more broad strokes um my first choice i wanted to talk about was amadeus which have you, you guys have yeah. both seen amadeus it's been right? a long time 
It's been a long time. About a decade. I saw me. it not recently. It was on. It might even still be on Netflix. But I love or it. Something. I just recently Is it? watched it. I, I think it's, it's on Prime. Prime. I think it's on Prime. Prime. Okay. Um, the director's Last cut's year, on Prime. Last year, I think I watched it. Um, Milos Foreman, who just passed away like mm. a year ago, too. Um, I wrote on here, it's a masterclass in writing the protagonist as the villain and the antagonist as the hero. Uh, Sally Airy, um, F. Marie Abraham. I mean... I'm I'm big on uh, I'm a big proponent of a protagonist does not need to be virtuous or yeah, the good or the good guy, down. and vice versa. And this movie is a perfect example yeah. because I love this movie. This is like top five for me. Oh, wow, I, I really love this movie. And whenever I watch it, while you can never argue, and while like you know the script gives so much sympathy to Amadeus himself, yeah. I still want Salieri to win. <laughs> I still want him to, you know, for God to respond. I don't even agree with Salieri's principles. Yeah, I, you know, he's a very religious man. He is. He he's he's uh, basically a murderer. Yeah, but the whole time I feel like I want him to win. I want him <laughs> to be as immortal as Amadeus. Yeah, and oddly enough, I want Amadeus to somehow fall. It's. I know that seems like unsympathetic, but it's only the way that the movie is structured that makes me feel yeah. like that. Because it's framed. And it does make you feel that it, way. Well, you're right. And it's, it, fa- it's a fascinating bounce off of the topic of I that, just discussed. Because it's a reversal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, and it's it's got the framing device with Salieri in a, in a he's like pathetic in an old, old age home, losing his mind. Mm-hmm. And you already start off with extreme sympathy for so this So there's guy. your rooting influence mm-hmm. right there. Right. Yeah, I, yeah. I feel like I'm no matter how rotten and terribly maligned his faith is in God and what he assumes God is, is even so corrupt. <laughs> yeah. I still want him to like get his due. Mm-hmm. And that is an amazing piece of writing. To yeah. Me, considering know? who he is and what he does. Right. It, there's no, <laughs> there's no logical reason for me to say that he should win. But when I watch it, I want him to win. <laughs> I want him to achieve his dream, his goal, you know, and you know, despite despite everything, being wrong. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's just that's just there's so there's very few movies where I feel that ardent, yeah, about the protagonist who is also a villain. <laughs> where I'm like, <laughs> no, I want I I sympathize with Salieri, you know, like yeah. why <laughs> why yeah, he's the underdog too of the story. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's another one of the rooting influencers. Yeah, the, to frame everything like there's a lot of dialogue in the movie that that because of because it's coming from him, it frames everything as um. A creativity and talent is a gift from God, right? And so he frames himself as the underdog because God did not give him the gift. Mm. So there's already, there's this amazing like sympathy arc yeah. that goes on through the whole thing. Like mm-hmm. I have been cheated. You can relate. Everybody can relate <laughs> right, to that. Right, right, right. And Amadeus, and, and, and the way it portrays Amadeus is that he's been like touched by the finger of Christ <laughs> and he is perfect and, you know, and, and he doesn't even care, you know, yeah. it's. There, there's few movies where I can say I feel like that yeah, about. I'm, I'm racking this. my brain, Stephen. Think of another movie like yeah. that. Um, maybe it's a unique there, case. It's a unique case. There's yeah. probably other examples, but maybe. I feel strongly as like this is the one I feel the most strong about. So, yeah, maybe Syndrome and The Incredibles. No, just uh, <laughs> I, I can't but even, yeah, <laughs> I don't. But but <laughs> no, that's not a terrible pool. You though. caught me monologuing. <laughs> He was kind of an underdog. He's a, yeah. he's a great character, but I don't feel like I want him no. to win. No, nah, you don't want him to win. In, in, a weird, yeah. in a weird sort of way, not another Oscar movie that I almost picked. Yeah. It's not really what you're saying at all. Okay. But <laughs> Silence of the Lambs. You want him to get away? No, that's yeah, not bad. You, I mean, yeah, you do. You know Hannibal why? Lecter. That, I think in that case, too, like unlike Salieri, you respect Hannibal Lecter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Salieri, you're kind of like, for anyone who's ever been stepped on or felt like they're not good enough, Salieri's kind of like, the character every human can see eye to eye with because like, there's always the person standing over there who's a genius and you're like oh <laughs> but with Hannibal Lecter you respect that guy you're like yeah yeah, yeah like, also that guy also he um cares about Jodie Foster's he does right? I think that's and that big, that's like he's kind almost of like a the cat. it's a save yeah, the cat yeah. in some ways yeah um, so yeah yeah also Dude, Am- that's a great choice Bob. yeah and also I would say Amadeus is very not traditionally structured I as love, a movie yeah. It's just not. Um, it is more like a biopic yeah. kind of thing, yeah. and I, I didn't want to talk about that aspect. But it's very non traditional for the stuff. There's we do a lot of stuff, things that we, you could talk about. Yeah, right. But <laughs> yeah. but I think it all works. Yeah, I, I don't agree. think it's like you know what I mean. It's different, but it works. It's kind of like a, a Coen Brothers type of yeah 
thing, you know. But outside the box. Yeah, mm. that's all I want to say about Amadeus. Yeah. So the next one I picked was the one we already mentioned uh, earlier, The Exorcist. And uh, I spoiled the, it. The reason I picked The Exorcist, <laughs> but it's okay, is is when I looked it up, I was sort of shocked to realize it won an Oscar. You know, it actually Me too. It you was, don't think of like writing and The Exorcist. Usually. No, no, but it, yeah, it and it was right? adapted from a you know best selling book. Um, it was also the first horror movie not only to win this oscar but to be nominated for a best picture award um wow so and i don't know how many other ones there are silence of the lambs i guess if you yeah. count it as yeah. horror um you better <laughs> yeah i i do yeah uh, i know you do what um, I, rosemary's baby was that nominated yeah, i'm not uh, sure i'd it? have to google I, mean, I bet it wasn't uh, but i'd have to google it might have been um, now you're gonna have me thinking about. Well, this, this is all news to me that th- that The Exorcist was nominated best, for these awards. Best I didn't know that. Right, right, and it, it, that's what. And it. So what it got me to thinking is now there's this whole thing with elevated horror, mm-hmm. right? And yeah, uh, that term, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so I wanted to talk about elevated horror because I think The Exorcist was elevated horror before there was elevated before horror. There was before no. Hereditary, yeah. exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, listen to our Hereditary episode yeah. now on yeah, now iTunes put, and get out as well. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> get yeah, out. get out. So my my take on elevated horror, and I'll just before there was elevated horror, I remember I was going around pitching things and elevated action was the thing. That was the thing. Can you give us an example of elevated action? Elevated action was movies with Liam Neeson in it. (laughs) That was elevated (laughs) action. It was basically like Taken. Uh, They considered that elevated. elevated? Yeah. So so what I... And I was always like, why is that elevated? I will find you. And I honestly always felt like the difference between elevated action and non-elevated action is... Liam Neeson versus Jean Claude Van Damme. If you cast Jean Claude Van Damme in the same movie, at doing the same line, that makes sense. Though. It's probably not elevated anymore. Also, like a Van Damme movie is going to have a slight like wink to it. It, it does because of him it does. acting. They're in there, and maybe they're not doing the thing with the acting. <laughs> Paul Verhoeven, no. <laughs> Paul Verhoeven said he put Arnold in his movies because Arnold brings a slight wink to everything. You yeah, know, like like right. his Total Recall is supposed to be kind of funny. Yeah, <laughs> Cause I mean, it's Arnold. Yeah. It's it's Commando yeah. versus Taken. Whatever you know. Yeah. Okay. The difference. All right. Okay. Um. So I think that's the way I approach art. Why is this important? Is it important? I don't really think this is an important concept to the consumer. I don't think it's important for the consumer to really know what elevated horror is as much as the writer to know what elevated horror is. I feel like that's something we talk about, not like the layman person that's not concerned with this. I don't think there there needs to be a debate among consumers. Like, you know, there always was elevated horror. There is an elevated horror. I think where it's important is if you are a spec script writer – you might want to think about elevated horror because it widens the people. <laughs> Somebody's going to write an elevator horror movie. An elevator horror. <laughs> they miss Jamie you. said to do it. <laughs> <laughs> write an elevated elevator horror. M, M. Night. <laughs> well, I guess that was Devil, wasn't yeah, it? M. Night. Yeah, M. Night is done. <laughs> um, M. Night's already been there. So, elevator horror is very popular these days. <laughs> yeah. oh, elevator. Wasn't that in a movie? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, I, I think as, as writers who write spec screenplays, it, if you write this kind of quote unquote elevated horror, it can broaden your buyers. Um, and really, here's what I would suggest write the kind of horror movie that can get Tony Collette or Emily Blunt. That's elevated horror to me. If, if somebody like that, if you feel so they, about having a, they want a, to do a it, central character that has a instead bit of, more. Instead of getting that, if you write a movie that gets a Robert England cameo. Right. You're doing it wrong. If you're writing for that, if you're trying to end those, that's yeah. your end meet. Your so end would goal. you say so the uh, the emphasis say on the Ellen not... Burstyn character is what uh... Ellen Burstyn, but also the priest, the, uh, priest. the faith, yeah. the 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 whole thematic, Manny. like, and even even Friedkin yeah. would yeah. say he he said I didn't write. He said this for many years. He said I didn't make a horror movie. I made a movie about faith. And while I do think he made a horror movie, and I think it's fine, all horror movies kind of need a metaphor. This is where this debate gets a little lame because it assumes that all the other movies are stupid. Right. And they're not stupid. In fact, I know I prefer the other ones, but yeah, that's yeah. fine. Like you're not wrong. Yeah. It's like, B- yeah. Buffy, the vampire slayer. Um, when Whedon worked on those for years, he, one of his central tenets was monsters metaphor. All monsters have to be a metaphor for something. I've made plenty of Bihar movies. And I'm always asked the question, what, what it's the metaphor for. So it's not like, you know, all those other slasher movies, you know, if you watch Nightmare on Elm Street, we've talked about in the podcast. That's a metaphor. It has a yeah. deep themes. It, yeah. it has all kinds of things. So this is just good practice in general for your horror mm-hmm. movies. 
Now, if you're really making some kind of movie where you want to check your brain at the door, maybe you're not doing it. But even those check your brain at the doors usually have a central theme and yeah. are elevated. So I just think learn the lesson of The Exorcist. It's not and a good these, term. And these elevated quote unquote yeah. things and put them in all your scripts. Um, so write something. But on the flip side, right now, if you can create something that can chase Tony Collette or Emily Blunt or some other, you know, actor that wouldn't normally do a, you know, Truth or Dare or something. Not, yeah. the, not the crap on Truth or Dare. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, but I, I think there is something for you because it, it brings bye -bye something man. else. The Bye Bye Man or one of these <laughs> movies. Um, but if you put... Um, if you put Emily Blunt in the Bye Bye Man, suddenly it elevates. Suddenly it, it elevates. Yeah, it would yeah. be right. Brings yeah. more to and, it and retitle it. It's probably. weird too, because like to me, Nightmare on Elm Street One is an elevated horror movie. I would. I the would, sequels might not. It be has that, the the tenants of that, of right? That, yes. Yeah. Hey, totally. I I I don't disagree at all. Yeah. But yeah. It, the, you know. But there's a wishy washy line. Yeah. I I think movies. I like, argue that the first movie in most of those franchises <laughs> yeah. was elevated horror, and then yeah. it, the sequels changed it. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It it's a, it depends on how you look at. I think most of the elevated ones I see, I think it really hints that there's some kind of relationship drama right. at the core of it. That's a good way to um, put it. Uh, a lot also of less blood. Well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> you know, uh, I think. You know, just like there's we, not nudity in the first five minutes. We, <laughs> we talked about Get Out and Hereditary, and Hereditary has the grief thing in the family unit. Yeah, Get Out has you know this kind of social message. Um, this guy going to meet the parents, and they don't know he's he's an African American. All that stuff, or they do know. Um, they have these kind of social they love things, Green Book. relationships at the core. They love Green Book. Green Book. <laughs> that, that'll be in the sequel for sure. <laughs> so anyway, that that's my my it's take. A good call. They've been around yeah. for a while, and there were elevated horror movies. I think The Fly is a good example. Oh, yeah. Carrie's a good example. Yeah. Psycho is a I good mean, example. Cronenberg yeah. is elevated horror. Absolutely, right? yeah. absolutely. Body oh, elevated that. body horror. How's that? Just because there yeah, there aren't that. a lot of movies yeah. between The Exorcist and what came next that got nominated for Best Picture. Um, yeah, I, it's sad. I think that's changing, though. I think so, I think too. Get Out, Get Out almost changed it. Mm -hmm. um, Hereditary, certainly people were crying for some nomination. I think Tony Clegg, I think we all agree Tony Clegg getting a nom, a nom would be nice. It would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. even if you didn't like the movie, like, yeah. she, you know, yeah. acting is acting. Yeah. yeah, right. But best original screenplay, The Exorcist, and Had up no for best idea. picture. Had no idea. Had no idea. God, well, I mean, if I was gonna it. guess a horror movie that got nominated, that would yeah. be in the top two of my guesses. So. It's hard to quantify what you're discussing because it's it basically describes a movie, a horror movie that the non horror fan would watch. And what is that? That's right. And I, the, and, and I think it brings in both sides because I yeah. do think the horror, the horror. I think you're right. The horror fan loves it. Still watch but, it, but the, but somebody else who never watches a yeah. horror movie might might. Put it on, and that's what a quiet place did. And, and it, get out, yeah, and I get think out. About... They bring in these non horror fans, and they're willing to watch it. And there's something there that that attracts the non horror. Uh, fans. Honestly, besides John Krasinski, I got look. <laughs> yeah. here's what you want to do: you want to write a horror movie that your buddy down the street's gonna like, and that all your aunts and uncles that you sit around the Thanksgiving table that you argue with that they'll like too. Yeah, but <laughs> what is right. that? What is that? Right, that's How what I'm do saying. You quantify Find that. that. That's hereditary. Or something. No, I, yeah. I honestly think the key is dig into that relationship drama. Dig yeah. into the main characters. Make it yeah. character based. Almost like um, if you take out the genre element, it would work on its own. There, there's an element of it that works. Yeah. Also, I'd probably right. say, don't lean on comedy. Probably true. And yeah. you know me, I'm a Same horror way. comedy guy. Yeah. So, so I think it, we so, all are. I mean, yeah. we're sitting at the table with Jimmy here. I'm me and you're you. Yeah, I think yeah. Jimmy intended those to be dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> he thought they were elevated. You know, just... when he Damn wrote, it! No one understands. When he wrote Call Girl. It was supposed to be the next exercise. <laughs> That's right. Call Girl Control. It was elevated. totally supposed. <laughs> he was expecting it's Meryl Streep. It's Chris's fault. Blame Chris. <laughs> okay. When, when they couldn't get Meryl Streep. I'm kidding. Chris I'm kidding. Cast, yeah. <laughs> elevated horror. He and I have never had this conversation about elevated. But I horror. think. You guys weren't trying to do that. Oh no, Never. not at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We were seeking look, out the Stuart Gordon you look, fans. Man. You look, yeah. yeah, yeah. If you look at my favorite things, my favorite movie, horror movies growing up, it's Reanimator, Evil Dead. Yeah. Um, the Peter Jackson movies. They're the ones. Yeah. That yeah, yeah the Frighteners is one of my favorite horror yeah. movies, and that's yeah. not a. It's not a horror movie, yeah. really. I mean, yeah. you know, um, Dead Alive. Well, that yeah. was a great topic. Great topic, Jimmy. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Jimmy. Okay. <laughs> 
Jamie d- never knows his greatness. Um, That's why we love him. I know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so this one, I did a deep dive. I'm sorry, guys. I did a deep dive. Okay. It's a okay, big piece of paper right fuck. there. Deep dive. It must be the abyss. <laughs> That's right. Dun, dun, dun. Which is finally James being Cameron. restored. It's finally being restored. They're going to put it on Blu-ray. I'm a fan of the abyss. I it's really great. am. Um, okay, so I, so I chose Little Miss Sunshine. Um, and I chose it. Um, how do you pronounce his name? Michael Arndt? That you got it. Mm-hmm. Arndt? Okay. Yeah. So it's written by Michael Arndt. And I don't know if I said American Beauty is written by Alan Ball, but if you don't know that, he also did uh, uh, Six Feet Under like and a lot of stuff after that. But um, was this Michael Arndt's first thing? It was at least his first big thing. Interestingly enough, I, I used to be an American Zoetrope guy. So uh, Francis Ford Coppola okay. – had a website that we could go on and get peer reviews from. Yeah. You know, you had to read somebody's, they would read yours. Michael Arndt posted apparently Little Miss Sunshine to that site. I didn't see it, wow. but he was on that site back when I was. So it Did was you one use of his early Zotrope? all the time. That's oh, th- when I first came through, that's that was my thing. Is it still yeah. out there? It's still out there. Awesome. Had, do you have to do something to become a member? Or? No, uh, it's free is, to sign up. I mean, it's, is it is there a give and take though? In order to a get a review, you give a review. So you right? have to read three scripts to, to, to get one review. Okay. Um, now, it was easy back in my day when there were a thousand scripts up on it. Now you go up there, there's like 10. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened. It, it's kind of become a bit of a ghost town, yeah. but people still use it. And yeah. uh, a lot of us came from that. It was like early 2000s. And Michael Arndt, apparently, he was the poster boy for that site. Even that? though I don't, I was part of that community. I don't remember, I don't remember. him. So my guess is he stopped in, did his thing, but yeah, it took it that. elsewhere and grew yeah. elsewhere. Um, so, and then he ended up doing Toy Story 3 mm-hmm. and the first draft of The Force Awakens yep. and uh, uh, lots of other stuff. Arguably so, the best Toy Story. And the story. very awesome, so, uh, yeah. another one. the very yeah. awesome video you can find out there about great finales. Ah, is that the one with the stakes? That's the one. Mm. That's the one. You mean about, yes. about Little Miss Sunshine? Big fan. It, I, I think it hints stakes. at it. It's more about Star Wars, the uh, New Hope. Um, oh, oh, oh. Okay. Anything else. But so, I think he does hint at Little Miss Sunshine. So it's I'm, an hour long. It's great. Oh, it I gotta watch great. that. I've never seen it. It's one of the best screenwriting well, things out. Well there. worth. Send the me time. a link after well we're done. Well worth the time. We'll Look it up. Seek awesome. it out. It's awesome. Um, so I did uh, the ticking clock mechanism, the time pressure urgency in an ensemble drama, mm-hmm. because a lot of times when you throw out this urgency, the need for urgency, people think action. We got to get there and stop the bomb, like Mission Impossible. You know, we talked. It has like right, twenty three right. mechanisms, right? Um, this one has. Basically one, mm-hmm. but I wanted to track and just sh- show an example of how even this movie that's a drama, there's constant reminders of the urgency that makes you feel like these things are important. So it answers that why now question like very well, which informs the urgency, which is uh, they have to get uh, Olive to the Little Miss Sunshine Nationals pageant by Sunday, right? So like, why is the story happening now? It could only happen now because of that, right? So it answers the why now, which creates the ticking clock. Okay, and and just a reminder, like it doesn't have to be a clock. Like it can be <laughs> many things. This one's very right. literal. Right, it's, right. It's yeah, nonstop yeah, yeah. clocks, so it's very literal. But I think they did that because it's a drama, and they just wanted to stick with the character interactions. Right, right. It's also a road trip kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, that just it's inherent. It, this 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 road we're, trips we're can get episodic, but yeah. at least if you have that clock, it can kind of feel like you're going somewhere. Right. And the road trips really do have those, which mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but like for instance, kind of go back, back to Bill and Ted a little Bill bit. Bill and there. Ted a right. little bit, yeah. right. exactly. Right. True. But back, like for instance, in Back to the Future, there's many ticking clock mechanisms that aren't the actual clock that gets struck by lightning. There's the the family photo. They have to get a clock ticking, <laughs> and the ticking clock for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> right. The clock tower. But right. there's the family photo, and we're able to track as it becomes three family members to two family members to one family member and that creates urgency just by seeing right. that and you don't have to see it to see a clock and marty's hand disappearing while he's playing the guitar that's a ticking clock mechanism that mm-hmm. creates urgency without ever mentioning an actual clock okay so this one i'm just going to show you how there's there's 14 points we're just going to break them down let's go <laughs> speedy gonzalez here micro machines um At 17 minutes, so it takes 17 minutes before there's urgency. Um, At 17 minutes, we learn that Olive has been accepted into the pageant, and they have to get there by Sunday. So then we don't get another one. It's the longest uh, absence of urgency. Uh, We don't, but that it's all set up. They're setting up all the characters and the world. Mm -hmm. Um, So it takes its time on that. 
after that, we're constantly reminded. So at 29 minutes, Frank says, we have to drive 600 miles today and 200 miles tomorrow in order to get there on time. Bam. We get right. another ticking clock reset. Uh, one minute later, their car breaks down. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, And they find out that they can't get the part until Thursday. So they're like, oh, shit. So it's immediate urgency. And um, they say, but they can push the car in, into third gear instead. So they decide to do that. So there's a delay. And a delay is a ticking clock mechanism. It makes us go, oh, they're not going to get there. They also got the poster from that. Okay, good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, great. Um, yeah. So five minutes later, 35 minutes. So as you can see, it was only five minutes um, goes by in the movie. And we're reminded again. Um after a stressful stop at the gas station, they leave in a hurry and they, oh shit, they forget Olive and they have to go back. Right, right. So there's another delay and additional urgency to get her. We have to get her fast. So it's 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 two deadlines. Right. So it's a stacking deadline, which is another technique that you can use. You can do more than one at the same time. Um, seven minutes later at 42 minutes, Richard says they have to be packed and back on the road by 745 if they need, if they're going to get there in time. Like they're constantly um uh another another eight minutes later 51 minutes in olive says grandpa won't wake up <laughs> so the grandpa is dead so whole <laughs> right, shit right. here comes another huge delay in, and and the clock is ticking we've been reminded every five minutes right and um so and there's also additional urgency it's a double deadline we have to do something with the body like fast <laughs> mm -hmm. so they find out that uh so they're trying to take care of the body while also making it to nationals on time and they 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 five minutes later they say we have to get to redondo beach specifically by three o'clock today so they tell us the time that's the first time we've heard that okay so the clock has been reset right so well five minutes later um me and jamie are still here don't worry yeah <laughs> for anyone listening we're, they, just, we're letting jimmy go five five minutes later they find out they need to get a permit um to get the body across state lines so there's another delay shit um five minutes later we're now an hour in they uh they say screw it we're gonna take the body with us and hide it um and so that they can make it to the pageant on time uh three minutes later they get pulled over <laughs> Another delay, and it's a double deadline again because they're like, oh, shit, we have to convince this cop to give us the ticket as fast as possible before he finds the body. So you got two deadlines at the same right. time. Um, and so, you, so you can see there's like three scenes in there where they're stacking deadlines. Um, and then two minutes later, after the cop leaves because he finds the porn and he thinks that's what they're scared of him finding. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so two minutes later, uh, they say, it's 2.15, we're going to be late. Um, and then they say, if we're not there by three, she's not allowed to participate in the pageant. So, so the clock resets again. They got 45 minutes. Um, two minutes later, um, Dwayne finds out he's colorblind and they have to pull over again <laughs> because he's having a nervous breakdown because for 500 days he's been prepping to be a pilot and now he found out that he can't. Right. Um, so we know they have 45 minutes to get there and they have to pull over again. So there's another delay. Three minutes later, um, at one minute, one hour and 11 minutes, uh, we're shown that it's 2.55 and they have five minutes to get there. And they say, they're not going to make it. One minute later, they miss their turn. They have to go back the down the wrong way down the street and, and they pull up on the sidewalk like just to avoid traffic in order to get there. And at one hour and 14 minutes, they arrive at 3.04 um, and registration is closed, and they've missed it. But Wally they, World is closed. They right? exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They beg and they get registered. So, just shows you this is a drama. Mm -hmm. This is a character ensemble drama that exists just to explore the relationships between people, and yet we are reminded of the ticking clock fourteen times over the course of the movie, and we never go more than four minutes without being reminded of the time. And the reason I bring this up is because almost every script I read, almost every script, yeah, and I posted online today that I read 187 in the last year and a half. This is, this a is researched an opinion. This is an afterthought. No one cares about this, even in their dramas. We we are told the deadline on like page five, and then it's never mentioned again, at all for the whole script or. We're told the deadline, and then 40 pages later, they're like, oh, yeah, we have, like, the the clock is ticking, but it's not really that big of a deal. Or the movie ends, they achieve the goal, and we're like, 
there there we learned there was a deadline the whole time <laughs> like <laughs> wait what and right. so like we were never we never felt urgency or the worst one of all and also extremely common there's no urgency at all for the whole script and jamie i'm sure you see this mm -hmm. in in your students scripts sure. all the time where like literally everything that's happening it could happen at any time in the characters lives and they're not really anxious to to get things done or make things happen in kind the story of a, the what is it why now right mm -hmm. there's no why, why now, now and like right. it's it just meanders for like 120 pages and it could have happened at any time in the characters lives so i brought mm -hmm. this up mm -hmm. because yeah it's good yeah good. i just went thanks guys <laughs> We should do it. We should do an episode sometime where we talk about movies that don't have a why now that we like. Yeah, I would that's love a great. To. I think there's. A, I think a there's a few great, of them I could probably pull out of my book. Great lesson. I think our next one kind of has a. Well, that's a good call. We can we can talk about that okay. uh, teaser. For, tune teaser in next. Week. Tune next in week. In, to tune in in two weeks. That's not was, on the. That's not on the talking points list for next. We can we can bring it up. That was what you just heard was uh, writers blockbusters. Little Miss Sunshine episode by Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, Dude, you are a I'm thorough passionate. man. Let's I'm say that you are passionate. Stuff, You're man. a thorough man, Jimmy. Yeah. Um, Thanks for just letting me talk. No, that was great. <laughs> uh, that's a movie that I would never have. I've, I haven't watched it since it came out, but I never would have been like, man, this ticking clock mechanism is great. That's why I, I picked it. Yeah, I would never have thought that in a Little Miss Sunshine. I, I think so. it w it's what differentiates it from your typical Sundance kind of movie because it was kind of that kind of movie in some ways. It is a very Sundance But then movie. they put that in there, so it has that urgency. A lot of Sundance movies don't move. And yep. they kind of they fall. sit there. And not and that, to blame Sundance, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and, and this is not an insult, but that urgency makes it a broader hit. It does. Yeah. It, does, it makes uh, the people exactly. who wouldn't normally like that watch it and go like, this is pretty good. Yeah. This, I, I'm really into this. But right? like yeah. you said, it's not what you remember. And that's no. why it's good. Yeah. Because it's, it's invisible. It's mm -hmm. invisible. Right. right. And and but it's crucial. It's why it's so good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You take out that urgency. That movie, they're, they're just taking their time to get across the It might the country. be okay still. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. You're not going to revisit it. Yeah. Which I never did. But so all, the stress in the, all the stress <laughs> right. and the conflict between the characters is driven by that urgency. Right. So, yeah. That's why I chose it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That was good, man. Yeah. I, uh, I'm next. I chose. I can't believe we actually haven't. I guess we're not even 30 episodes in, but we've never talked about a Tarantino script. No, I got Pulp Fiction on the list for later this we'll year. Do, we'll eventually do an episode on a Tarantino script. Mm -hmm. I chose Django Unchained because I thought it was kind of recent. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's a movie I watch, I've watched a million times. Mm -hmm. And um, what I wrote down here is the structure of a saga, journey or road trip movie, which mm. you just you just oddly mentioned, Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, this movie, I feel like a lot of the setups and the payoffs are within the scenes themselves, mm -hmm. within the chunks of mm -hmm. the movie. It's, I mean, it has character arcs in it and stuff. Yeah, but it's it's much more a uh, saga, like written like a western saga or like, even a space saga. Like he goes somewhere, they do something, and that's a little movie. And then they go, and then they leave, and then they go, and they train a little bit, and then they go somewhere else, and they do something, <laughs> and that's its own little movie. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like episodes. It's like TV it's show. episodic. Yeah. It's it's like Django Unchained the the Amazon show would be almost as good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say this movie has great structure, but it doesn't need it. And it still works. Like, gotcha. I don't know if I could actually pinpoint the structure myself of mm -hmm. the movie. Like the, like the kind we always do like that. I don't know if it saves the cat at all, but it's Tarantino. So they probably, what it is is, and I haven't seen the movie. It's the all one right, Jimmy, Tarantino Jimmy movie. Jimmy hasn't I seen, seen it. So. It's the one Tarantino movie. It probably came out while I was making a movie. Jamie, you've seen it though, right? I have. Okay. I have. <clears throat> I've, I've probably only seen it once, so I don't okay. really remember. Right. But I would get I'd what say, I'm saying though, right? I'd say yeah. Tarantino does that in general, but usually because he's mixing the timeline. Mm -hmm. You don't even right. notice it. You know, so this is like a movie that doesn't mix the timeline. So it's, so just it's kinda, linear? Yeah. It's oh, yeah. Linear. Django's linear. Linear. but it, mm -hmm. it but it's also played off like 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 westerns i mean they're yeah. episodic sagas yeah. they don't it's not that three-act structure yeah. it's this is the journey of a man to his end you know like this, gotcha. that's it and the movie totally works it doesn't need that structure yeah of course i bet if we did a lot of older movies on this show we would be way looser but we, we'd be way looser and we'd find this type of structure way more often i think so that's true but also you know the, the, the difference is a lot of the older movies the westerns 
you find out they're only like 70 minutes, hmm. you know, 75 Yeah, minutes. they're not wasting your time. So yeah. what I'm saying is like the Tarantinos right. are usually two hours I think and 35 Django's, minutes. I think Django's so like 220. it's using that storytelling. Yeah, it's what? It's like two hours and 20. Yeah. It's, it's that's, not a that's short a, movie. That's yeah. a typical... I, I would say Tarantino Glorious way. Bastards kind of is episodic in its own way. His yeah. movies but he are shuffles episodic. the deck a little bit more, yeah. but flipping back between things. The shuffling so. makes it work, yeah. whereas this one being linear is why I'm happy to choose it. Yeah. it's Because it's not something, I feel like it's so different from the movies we normally talk about. Yeah. Hateful Eight so. starts Agreed. that way and then flashes back, and you know, yeah. so it kind of mixes it yeah. up. Yeah. I mean, he plays with structure. That's what he does. He does. Yeah. But this, I think, is traditional Western episodic structure. Mm -hmm. And I don't like I said I don't know if I could map it out. Right. It's kind of a road trip. I love movie. that. It's a road trip movie. I love mm -hmm. that. With two, you know, with two bounty hunters. It's not. They, you know, they go to a new town. They encounter someone. They go there. He gets revenge. They go. Do you there, think you know? it would have the sequence method? Because I haven't seen it. I maybe yes, perhaps. perhaps. Maybe it's yeah. more that than yeah. the big kind of the solo perfect. thing going yeah, on. Yeah. The but without the like arc Eight in the background. Eight movies without the big overall like. For example, we don't. The main villain of Django is uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, okay. and we don't meet him until really the third act. Mm -hmm. like, Interesting. Yeah, like that comes in later, and gotcha. he is the main villain. So is James is 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 the, are the main characters their own villains, their own worst enemies? Well, I, it I think it's more uh, no. environment is the villain. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's I the mean, road trip obstacles. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the fact the fact that you know a world in slavery and he's a free man bounty hunter. Yeah. Okay. You know, so. so it's there's plenty. Oh, there's plenty of stuff pushing <laughs> yeah. on him. That's how so. little I know about this movie. <laughs> oh, well, you should probably watch Django Unchained. Yeah. Sorry, um, Bob. Yeah, uh, I'm not mad. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's why I picked that because just structure basically. It's the road trip movie. That's awesome. Thing, you know, not, I, not to put I anybody on the spot. Is that the only Tarantino movie that's won an Oscar? Maybe no, you know what? Pulp Fiction or something. I think Pulp Fiction one because I think there was some controversy. But we chose not to choose that because yeah, we're, we're going to do, do an epi episode. Yeah. On we're going to do an episode yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think Pulp. Is one. I think Pulp won. off the top of my head. Let me I don't think it had to have won. If it Listen didn't, what what the hell are they doing? <laughs> um, yeah, that was, I, that was your crash one. I mean, it was something. so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think Far it's so influential. Well, Forrest Gump won the Best Picture that year. I know that. Because okay. people still debate what oh. should have won and everything. But so. that would have been adapted screenplay if that... Yeah, in this category... Yeah, it would be original. I'm almost positive Pulp won. Yeah, it did. Hey! hey, hey. 94. <laughs> <laughs> we chose. We just chose not to do it because we want to talk about it. On yeah, episode. we're going to do an yeah. episode later this year. I chose the Tarantino one, the win. That, yeah. that wasn't that. that <laughs> yeah. It's a good so, one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, Jamie, go ahead. So the next one I chose, and I realize now that we actually chose three adapted screenplays. So Amadeus was a play, believe it or not. It was adapted from a play. I just looked at some list I Googled, so I just yeah. picked movies no, that, I knew. It was adapted. No, it's fine. That's fine. Yeah, no, I'm I, fine with that. I did yeah. The Exorcist, which was a book. And the next one I'm doing, The Social Network, was a book that hadn't come out yet, oh. I, as I remember. I didn't know there um, was an actual book. Wait, it was a book that they had access to? to write. He had access. He had okay. the galleys, and he kind of went over it real quick, threw it away, and then did Aaron Sorkin wrote his own story. If I remember, like he mm. barely used it, you know, and he mm. kind of just said, okay, I got it. Mm -hmm. He threw it away. And just it. <laughs> yeah, um, I get it. <laughs> yeah. That sounds yeah. about right with him. I'll make my own. <laughs> so the uh, social network I chose, and maybe this is one we do in another podcast. I love this movie. It's probably one of my favorite movies in the 2000 era. Uh, what so year since, was it? Did it come out? I know you were going to make Oh, I thought you had it up. You, how You're doing you stuff on the, the laptop. No, it's, <laughs> yeah, um, what's the box it's 2010. It's 2010. <laughs> It, it, Damn, that's it, nine it, years, years old. That, it beat Holy out. Crap. It beat out 127 hours. Toy Story three, True Grit, and Winter's Bone. They were mm. the movies that it beat out. Man. Um, that's awesome that Toy Story three was nominated. Yeah, yeah. Michael Art. Yeah. Michael Art. There yeah. he goes. Yeah. He's up again. Uh, so I chose this movie for many. I love this movie. I think it's a great biopic. It has an interesting framing device with the uh, trial. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that always strikes me from this movie. I show the first scene of this movie to students in my class almost every year. And every time I watch that first scene, I love the first scene. Uh, Is um, that the, the meal? Yeah. They're so, so they're they're at a bar. And um, right now, go Google it. It's probably out there online. You probably shouldn't be watching it's it. It's exciting. But just yeah, it's ex this exciting back and forth, like a joust between him and his girlfriend. And he he's talking about these things called final clubs and how he's going to get in. 
and she's kind of being self-deprecating, or not even self-deprecating, but she's kind of teasing him about it a little bit. And it just goes back and forth where he gets insulted. He starts challenging her choices, <laughs> and, like of school and things like that. But it does all these different things. You know, it reveals character and like his inner life in this one scene. And it, first of all, it's completely entertaining. It's like one of the most entertaining scenes. Like if I just want to watch one scene, and literally when I show this to my students every year, I pay attention to like half the time when I show stuff to students, it's your typical thing where then I go on my cell phone and just start looking at Facebook, <laughs> the social network, or Twitter. <laughs> the social network. Facebook, the real thing instead of the movie. But, but whenever I show this scene, I actually watch it because I, I love it. Even the thousandth time I've watched it, I still love the scene. Um, you know, he, he's talking about, it has tons of exposition. It talks about his friend Eduardo and how he makes money uh on on uh predicting uh the weather and it's really because of oil prospects and you know all this stuff and it shows how smart he is it shows how obsessed he is with getting ahead it shows that he's kind of this character who's not reading all the signals and his girlfriend is reading the signals um it also sets up the th it sets up the themes of the piece it sets up his personality it sets up his drive. It sets up his situation. And it also serves as the inciting incident because mm, he, he breaks up with her on the spot. And that's what – or she breaks up with him. And he goes home and writes, you know, that, what was it called? Face smash or something like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And that's what starts as the um, hot or not. Uh, yeah. That's what starts as the, uh, the, you know, Facebook, really. So that's the inciting incident. And then even the last line of the scene is the theme of the movie. Um, she she looks at him and says, "I'm sure one day." And I didn't. I'm riffing on this. Uh, I should know it because I watched this so many times. But she says <laughs> she looks across to him and says, "I'm sure one day you're going to be a great computer science person, but you're also going to be an asshole." You know, <laughs> and, it's, and, and, that, and that's kind of the theme of the movie. Uh, can you be one and not the other? Uh, a theme he also says almost in the exact same words in Jobs. Um, uh, what Seth Rogen kind of yells at him. He says, it's not binary. Right. You know, it yeah. says you can, yeah. you can be a good business person and not, not be an asshole. You know, it's almost the same thing. So I almost good. think that's something Sorkin wrestles, wrestles with. You know with. what I mean? His yeah. greatness versus his Well, don't, Jamie, he used to be a computer programmer, so you, <laughs> you cannot be a good computer programmer right. without being an asshole. Right. Um, <laughs> Trust me. And yeah, Jamie's a just, good computer programmer. That's right. That's right. You cannot be one. Uh, right. But, but yeah, no. So it does all those things in the snappy jousting dialogue, that Sorkin dialogue at its best. I, I don't think it's my favorite Sorkin thing. And I think Mine too. The fact that Fincher comes to it um, helps a lot. Uh, I'm a big fan of Jobs as well. They're like two of my favorites. Also, I'm, I'm an easy mark for the computer stuff, but, <laughs> but that's you know, why I picked. And with I that picked team, it. I I wouldn't be opposed to like Sorkin writing a sequel now. Yeah, wow. sure. I think that the one thing, if I had a criticism of that movie, is like it, the third act. It just kind of doesn't have. It has just like, and then real life happened. Yeah, yeah it, it peters out a little bit. Yeah, which the but framing now the third device act, helps. I feel like yeah, the third does. act happened though. Mm -hmm. Now, like we mm -hmm. just we lived the third act. Yeah, it's its own movie. Right. Like, yeah. I, I feel like the rest of that movie just happened in the last two but years. I, I think what Sorkin does, he frames it in that, are you an asshole? Are you a successful yeah, person? Yeah, no, you're right. And he answers that question in the courtroom aspects of it and things like that. So, um, It's a great you know, movie. I wasn't I, trying to I say do great think, movie. I do think yeah. you could have a sequel because there, now there's a whole new chapter. There is a whole yeah. new chapter to it. So Russia. I think you could do it. <laughs> Facebook kind of changed the world. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, so, Jamie. And, I don't have a third okay. one. Mm. I spent all you my sure? time Pre on two. Pre Preston Sturgis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I was going to talk about me, I mean, yeah. I can bring it up. I didn't study it. I didn't watch it. Yeah, I can just bring it up. My third it. one was going to be Almost Famous. And the reason I brought it up is, um, and I could, I feel like any of these movies we discussed, you could talk about it, even mm -hmm. though I haven't seen this, Django. And this could have been nine episodes. Yeah. I mean, easily. Yeah, So exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, antagonism in a drama when there's no villain mm -hmm. and um i was gonna break down all the various uses of it because in almost famous i mean there are so many good mm -hmm. uh forces of antagonism from our friendly characters from the characters we're rooting for and that we love um a great example of it um is his mom right she's not even there 
with him, but he fears her. Right. And he calls her. He's so scared. He keeps calling her. She doesn't have a, an, a way to like keep tabs on him, but right. he fears the wrath of his mother so much. And also like her concern for him um, that he keeps calling home. And then of course she's like, what are you doing? Like Francis, how do you pronounce her last name? McDormand. McDormand. Yeah. Um, and she's just a great uh, use of internal antagonism mm -hmm. and the band itself constantly. And that comes to a head. They're constantly battling back and forth between each other. Um, and that comes to a head on the plane when everybody's arguing and then everybody's dying and then they reverse it and they're like, I love you, man. Right. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's uh, antagonism between Penny. You know, uh, Penny is the antagonist for a character we don't know, like right, the, right. The, the wife of uh, Billy. Uh, what's his last? Billy Crudup's uh, mm -hmm. musician character. I was, gonna, I, I was gonna have <laughs> all of these character names and everything. Right. I didn't watch it, but I'm just going off the top of my head. So it's if just... anyone's not clear, Jamie it, Jimmy thought that we all were gonna watch every movie. Yeah, and then me and Jamie did <laughs> not do. do that at all. Yeah, we just riffed. <laughs> yeah, we just totally riffed. Well, I'm riffing here, and <laughs> no, uh, Almost Famous is a great example of how even when you don't have a villain and you have a drama, you can still have antagonists within each scene and they can be the characters that we're caring about you know that we're rooting for but they cause each other antagonism it's like it's friendly antagonism it's no, the internal. whole movie yeah. has push pull the whole movie yeah and, and it feels like he shouldn't be where he is the entire movie yeah and that exactly feeling and everyone's right. against yeah. him in that way because yeah. he's young it's the fish out of water mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. a great fish out of water story um it's just a great example of how to do uh internal antagonism in a drama without a villain and have it a, a through line of constant conflict caused by these characters that's, that's good yeah. yeah see you're good at riffing i can just riff yeah. that's not my style i'm I one know. of these guys I man i gotta study so <laughs> i guess the last choice is up to me and i chose i would say one of the greatest movies ever made which is network and I was trying, I was racking my brain to think about what I wanted to say about Network because I kind of just chose movies that I knew, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I wrote the art of writing character speeches that are rel relevant to the narrative and structure, mm -hmm. which I mean, this movie has uh, three, I would say, three grand speech mm -hmm. scenes that are incredible, mm -hmm. and they're not throwaway. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. No, not at all. But they're also completely relevant to what's happening on screen and with the characters. And they're also oddly like prescient about the world to the point where the network's maybe one of the most relevant it's really movies timely. ever made. Yeah. Still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh I don't know if I have any tools and tricks about writing great speeches, but I've, I've we've never talked about speeches in movies I before. So I like I can you guys I oh, wanted I wanted to ask you guys, could you help me figure out why they work so well they're in thematic. Network? I, you yeah. think it's are thematic? I mean, they work in the narrative. I, I, I mean, they're definitely thematic. I think the, if I, I, just making this up off the top of my head, I think it's a little bit like what we say about promise of the premise and premise execution. You have to write the speech that only that character can right. say in and that I, movie. Yeah. In that movie, and yeah. if you can pull that off, whatever. It means to pull that off, but that should be your almost and litmus test. It rings test. true, and no, it doesn't sound like it's preachy the, from the, the three writer. speeches that ring out in my head are the the two H Howard Beale ones, the Mad as Hell, mm -hmm. and then the one he kind of gives when he first becomes a TV personality, mm -hmm. the fun and games of yeah. him being a TV personality, <laughs> yeah. and then there's the one uh, that Ned Beatty delivers in the end, mm -hmm. in the private room yeah. when he's yelling, you know, right. like that one. Like those, those are the three speeches yeah. I was trying to talk about i think yeah. he said it perfectly yeah you said it's, it perfect James. yeah because mm -hmm. because if you don't do that then it sounds like the writing yeah and i i've written those bad speeches Me before <laughs> so i kind of recognize them Still like, do. yeah <laughs> you, you have to really whether the character's humorous whether they're a little dim whether they're super smart whatever it is whether their point of view is a certain thing, whether they're angry, you have to figure out their whole psychology well, and then just bring that and paint. Yeah, your, I, if I you've done like, the work, it'll. it'll I feel like resonate. when you say the word speeches and scripts or mm -hmm. movies, people think of movies like Braveheart or Independence Day, right. where the entire movie has built up <laughs> to the point where it has earned enough that it can now stop for a moment and let a character. Talk for a page. Talk, talk for a whole page. <laughs> Whereas this movie, I would say, does it like i said three times but um, also it's you know? motivated to the story like yeah. they're supposed to talk mm -hmm. for long periods of time yeah. direct address yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. That that's yeah. a good point. I mean, the whole point of that character. Yes, is that's what dangerous. I was looking for. Yeah, yeah. director dress. It's you motivated. Guys, these terms, I can't yeah. keep them all. It's director dress, <laughs> and right. it's motivated to the story itself mm-hmm. that they would be mm-hmm. giving it, yeah. it exactly this way. So we 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 take it in. We believe I, it. I think sometimes bad speeches or people just don't realize that it should be dialogue and they write a speech. Yeah. You know, it's like they just write a speech and it's like, no, that should be back and a forth. Discussion. And a discussion. A yeah. bad speech is an essay. Right. Yeah. Right. They, it's just they an could essay. They easily script, turn it right. into, a, is, into an argument, mm-hmm. a right. debate. Yeah. And that makes it way more interesting anyway. When right. you have the opposing back and forth, well, what about this? You're wrong. Well, no, I'm not wrong. You know, yeah. There's also everything, the errata surrounding the speeches in this movie. Like, yes. you know how Howard Beale's life is almost on the oh, line, yeah. but he's a man that will stop you at nothing You know what's motivating say. these yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, now, I mean, network right. is, yeah. I don't feel like, we could do a whole episode on network. Yeah, I know. But that's all I want to say. The speech thing is something we've never discussed on It's show. a good one. Yeah. yeah, uh, we, yeah. we don't really, we always say we're going to talk about dialogue tips, but we never do. It's something yeah. we will bring up at some point. We'll yeah. In a Pulp Fiction yeah. episode. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah probably, that's a great right? one. Yeah. To just be that. Yes. Yeah. I think that's it. That's, that's all of our movies, yeah. right? This has been fun. That's it. It's this an interesting episode. We hope you guys give us some feedback. Anyone yeah. listening, did you like us doing this? Because we can do this when the Oscars come did around. Did I talk too much? Did Jimmy <laughs> talk too much? <laughs> did you hate Little Miss Sunshine and you not listening anymore? <laughs> Next week is the Academy Award winners we hate. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that would be really hard for me to do. <laughs> I feel like Jamie might enjoy it. it we fun. are we are we are desperate to find a hot take from Jamie episode because we've talked about this. We've got Bob. We've got me. Me feisty about hereditary. Yeah. Uh, what did I hate? I didn't hate anything. Uh, yeah, I don't think Bob hated anything. We hated me. <laughs> no, I didn't. Just no, I just we've had hot takes. <laughs> yeah. Jamie's not a hot. You're you're a very lukewarm take. Luke yeah, you're lukewarm. Takes. I just want to hear Jamie at one point go. I freaking hated this movie. Yeah, this movie like, did not work at all for yeah. me. I want you to be like, it's trash. Throw it in the dumpster. <laughs> it's done. Canceled. <laughs> no, I am yeah. of the mindset that if you don't have something nice to say about the movie, don't worry about it. But w- it would be fun to have Bob and I going, "This is great," and Jamie going, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> We'll when we one. do Die Hard, because we know Jamie hates Die yeah, Hard. Die- we'll, find one. <laughs> That's right. well, either way, uh, this was interesting. Thanks, yeah, guys. Thanks for listening. If you like this, tell us. Yeah, because we'll we can do we can more do weird. Ones. We can do more weird episodes. Yeah. Okay. Really weird. Really. Yeah. Like, we're there. not even talking about movies. Weird. Right. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye. Bye. You have just listened to Writers Blockbusters, a screenwriting podcast featuring two professionals. And another guy, available only on Thundergrunt. <laughs>